Hi, my name is Eric Johnston, and I'm an aviation photographer. Join me as I document all kinds of aircraft from big to small and cool to, well, really cool. This video is proudly sponsored by Air Models. Check out their excellent variety of resin and die-cast aircraft models with over 400 commercial and military aircraft and helicopters available. Click the link in the description to see more from Air Models. Hi, uh, my name's Gary Ginrich, and this is the Mid-America Flight Museum's latest acquisition. It's a UH-1H model, and I flew these in Vietnam for about a thousand hours of combat time, and about another uh, 4,000 hours as an instructor for uh, the Army Reserves. Uh, this helicopter was the primary helicopter that the Army used in Vietnam and it was quite the work, uh, workhorse. And to give you a little brief on uh, pre-flighting it and whatnot, starting out from the front, I'll point out some differences in Vietnam, uh, the ones that we flew, but this helicopter is as close to stock as any helicopter I flew in Vietnam. That's what's so interesting about it. This was a modification after Vietnam and uh, I'm not sure whether anybody used these. This was for mounting vertical antennas, and uh, I didn't see any like that in Vietnam. I'm not saying they didn't have them or whatnot. And the other thing we did not have in Vietnam was this wire strike. It's like a knife edge blade there and up top to where if you did inadvertently when you were flying low, hit a wire, there's a good chance that that mechanism would break the wire so it wouldn't wrap around your rotor blades. So that's something that came in after the war. Of course, we didn't have any problems with running into wires in the war. Uh, walking around here, let me just open the door up. What's so interesting about this helicopter, when I say it's completely stock like we flew in Vietnam, you see these H models around from time to time, but you don't ever see them with the original armor seats that we had in Vietnam. And as you can see, it's armor here, and you have this panel that after you get in, you slide this forward and it gave you protection over here. There was another form of protection we had, it was called the chicken plate, and that wrapped around your uh, neck, and it looked like a police officer's uh, bulletproof vest that they have nowadays. The only thing is, it was made out of some type of cement material, and it was this thick. And if you were flying a lot of hours, it was so cumbersome and so hard on you that I didn't use it. You know, a lot of guys wouldn't even think about flying without it, but I didn't use it. And uh, it was just too tough on my neck. So moving back along here, uh, if you can shoot inside here, um, for ease of light weight and whatnot, the floor in this helicopter is made out of magnesium. And that's good for getting strength and light weight the bad part about it being magnesium is uh, if you did get on fire, that, that's a ferocious fire, a ferocious fire. So that was the only drawback to that. And as you can see, this is configured to have two seats forward. And then we have five seats across the bench here. And then back here, we called this the gunner's well. And there's two seats here, but we primarily ran a door gunner, just one guy in this seat. And we had the M60 mounted on this, on stanchions to where the guy could run that M60 like this and turn it any way he needed to turn it. And um, I'll tell you, it was remarkable how accurate in such a short amount of time, if you had a door gunner on here, where you could circle a target and say there might be a very small like mortar crater, and I'd take them out when they needed some practice and I'd circle that. And it was amazing how they could put every round in a small, uh, 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 mortar hole. They could put every round in and we're like a thousand feet off the ground. It's just amazing how quick. Of course they had the tracers to help them. You know the tracer rounds one every fourth or third round however they set them up. But uh, these guys were tremendously accurate. So if you did get to see your target you could really uh, tear them up. Problem is in Vietnam a lot of fighting was in the jungle and you, you, you might see a muzzle flash or hear something shoot at you but you may not get a chance to see the guys on the ground. Now the uh, NVA would run these 51 caliber sites and they would set them in a little bit more of a location where they could move those barrels around and a lot of times you could see those. 
so that was a little bit different. But a 50 caliber can really raise a lot of hell with a helicopter, even if you're 3,000 feet. You know, 3,000 feet, you're away from the small arms, you're okay, you know, but uh, that 51, that, that could do a lot of damage. Well, getting back to the pre-flight part, though, um, this is uh, where we come in here and we pull this down to view our transmission level, which I haven't looked at this one, so I might as well look at it now. And it's uh, right where it should be. There's a little light that pops on and there's a fill line and they have this right to the fill line. So that's pretty good. The doors are pinned back for summertime operation. And in Vietnam, we always operated with the doors completely open. And a nice thing about that is the max speed on this is 120 knots. You can go, you can do 120 knots with the doors open. So that's good. If someone wanted, they could take the front doors off, but generally we kept those on. So let me uh, remove this pin here real quick. This is where we put fuel. It takes about 209 gallons. This thing will burn anywhere from 70 gallons to uh, about 95 gallons, depending on how fast you want to go. The faster you go, the more you burn. Up in here is the engine compartment, and what we'd look for on here in the engine compartment is the engine oil, which is right there, up there, a sight gauge for that. And just you're just looking, you know, we're not mechanics, you know, but we're just looking for condition and security, just to make sure nothing's popped loose. It's not like you can reach in here and touch anything, it's too far away. But a lot of the bolts have sli slippage marks on them where they put paint across it so you can tell if it moves. But moving back here, check the uh, stabilator. And uh, well, the only thing you'd be looking for here is there's some radical play in it. Just move it sideways and up and down to see if there's any vertical or lateral play. Now, does that move? Yes, it, it moves uh, somewhat in flight, depending on your speed. But it's not anything that you move. It's just interconnected with the controls. It's not anything you can slew. Black Hawk helicopters have one you can slew it. Back here is uh, what they call a 45 degree gearbox. And that's right here because the shaft comes back and then goes up 45 degrees to the other gearbox. There's a fluid sight gauge there. You check to make sure you got fluid there. Come back around here. And if the blade was untied, what I would do with the blade is I just grab the end and I move it back and forth a little bit to see if there's any play in the pitch change links up there. I did this one yesterday and it's, it's just solid. All the bearings and links on this are just 100% up to tolerance. There's no, I couldn't find any play in anything yesterday. Once again, same thing on this side. Just check it a little bit for movement and this thing's tight as can be. We have our battery for this helicopter, and this, this is just wiring for avionics and whatnot. Not much to see in there. You'd look for a broken wire or something like that. Um, some UEs have the battery mounted back here uh, on the other side where I was, that other compartment that I was on the other side, but this one has the battery mounted forward. This is more uh, avionics. I think that's one of the gyros for the dashboard. Um, And you're just looking for condition and security of your cowlings. Come forward here, same thing. Uh, you got a gunner's, gunner's well here. And um, the stanchions are right here for that M60 where you'd mount the stanchions for it. And uh, it's the same as the other side. Okay, once again, when you're not taking any uh, passengers, you want to make sure that your seat belts are strapped in so they don't flop around. Because you get going about 100 knots or whatever, and uh, if these aren't strapped in, they can flop out and do damage to the side of the helicopter. Everything's pretty secure here. Overall, condition of the skids you're looking for. This helicopter has skid shoes on it which during an auto rotation, when you touch down on the pavement, it tends to be real rough on the skids, but they have these skid shoes that take all the damage to where you don't do any damage to the skids themselves. Same thing up here. Uh, got the uh, crash release on the door if you need to jettison the door. 
if it wouldn't open, you pull that pin, it's a very simple operation, and then sometimes you gotta hit it with your elbow or kick it with your foot to get that thing, the door to uh, come completely loose. I guess now we could go up to the top, do the rotor head. When I was 20, it was a lot easier to get up here. And the rotor head, basically, what you're really looking for, once again, it's real important now about these slippage marks on bolts and cotter pins on the bolts as well. So uh, we normally start up here at uh, the scissors assembly here. And if you just grab onto this and move the shaft, if there's play in that, you would feel that immediately. Of course, this air helicopter doesn't have any, but we would check it anyway. Same here, you kind of put your thumb up against the uh, arm itself, then try and move it back and forth. And if you feel any feeling in your thumb, you would know that there is a problem and you'd get a mechanic to come out and uh, look at it with a feeler gauge and they would tell you if it's intolerance or not. Once again, here's another bearing and I'm wiggling in it and there just isn't it's got a little play, but a tiny amount of play. Moving down here on this assembly, it's called the dampener. And when you move it all the way up, there's, you're not going to be able to get this on film, but there's a pin in there. And it gets jammed out, and then you pull it down, about four to eight seconds, that pin should go in. And this one's going in perfectly. Once again, looking here for condition insecurity and slippage marks and whatnot. And then we move down, there's more bearings here. And um, this, tr this is called a trunnion bearing. And if there's any play, you can feel it right here. And there's also a little play supposed to be here. If it's excessive, you can feel it by wiggling it. And everything here is 100% secure, very tight bearings. Then I go around the other side and do the very same thing. Very tight, everything's very tight here. These are controlled push-pull tubes here that are hydraulically controlled. And back here we have a item called a short shaft and you check for grease coming up here because if that was to start leaking grease you might have a problem with it and that's about it you, you've got your air intakes here you want to make sure that they're not all clogged up a lot of times when people land in real grassy fields hay fields and whatnot a lot of stuff can get stuck on air and in the real dusty conditions like we used to have in Vietnam the dust could get through there and every so often they have to uh, wash the engine out with it running. They spray a, uh, a cleaning agent in there as it's running and it would clean the engines out. Other than that, uh, that's about it for the rotor head. Okay. Um, Full pre-flight procedure, you'd come up and check all the switch positions that you have. Circuit breakers, we've got some non-essential breakers that we don't use in this helicopter and they're all pops. You don't want electricity going to them if you're not really using that item. This is lighting, cockpit lighting and whatnot. Um, this, is a, this is a heater, a bleed air heater on and then a rotating switch on that. These are the wipers. Hardly ever use the wipers. Maintenance used to really get upset because the wipers would scratch the windshield even if there was a lot of rain on them. Of course, this is an anti-collision light that it would be on for start. And these are your uh, navigation lights and uh, he's keeping these on when he hits the battery. It's just, he's in the habit of doing that. Then you'd move forward here. There's a main generator cutoff. It has a safety uh, switch that holds it in the on position. So if you want to check that generator, you'd go ahead and pull this down and then turn it off. And uh, you'd make sure this, is, this switch is in a standby position. 
and then you'd see on the load meter here that your standby generator is working and that was just a test to make sure it worked then you'd throw this one back on the main gen generator on and you'd see the main generator pick the load back up to know everything was functioning right there and then coming down through here this is an old army transponder just like we had in the war and this is a UHF uh, uh, radio that we use in war. We used a lot of UHF frequencies in the war, uh, very seldom VHF frequencies. And this is a civilian transponder they put in here because they're not using this transponder anymore. And in this particular aircraft, they have a VHF radio here. And in uh, the ones I flew in Vietnam, we had an FM radio, Fox Mike we called it, and it was uh, a lot lower frequency, but we used that to talk to the units on the ground tactically, all the tanks and whatnot, and the people you're talking to, the radio men on the ground, they had Fox Mike radios, so you could talk directly to them. And here is a number two VHF, so there's two VHF uh, uh, radios in this. Coming up through here for, uh, for starting the engine, you've got an emergency governor position. And what happens is you have an automatic fuel control governor on this particular helicopter to where once you're at operating RPM and you increase the collective, it automatically feeds for you. Where some of the older helicopters, you would have to increase throttle. Well, this is uh, fuel controlled and where that doesn't need to be. And that has to be in the auto position. If you had certain types of emergencies, you'd have to bring this back to the emergency position and then you would manually use the throttle just like an old helicopter with a twist grip. Only thing being is that when this helicopter is in the emergency position, the throttle is ultra sensitive. So once again, that would only be in a particular emergency. And then you just come back up, hydraulic control switch on, force trim on. And what the force trim is, is um, <clears throat> without the force trim on, there's no feedback in the controls in a cyclic. It's just completely loose. And that's pretty much the way you want it when you're hovering around and flying it. But if, say you're flying uh, and it's going to be a long, straight and level type of flight, you go ahead and probably would use that force trim from time to time because when you put that on, it kind of holds the controls exactly where they are when you actually put it on. Then there's a button up here that you can push when you want to move the control. And wherever you move it to when you release it, it'll generally... Uh, hold it in that position. It's not to be confused with an autopilot or anything like that. It's just kind of, kind of like a little extra uh, trim to, uh, in fact, um, uh, hold the cyclic steady for you. But uh, it doesn't have any autopilot capabilities. You have to monitor it all the time and move it back because it does tend to wander. But it's better than having nothing as far as that goes. Um, and you check all your instruments, uh, a lot of times they put slippage marks on the glass, so that doesn't move. If that were to move, then your green arc and red arcs would change. So they have slippage marks on there, so the tape is on the glass, so you'll be able to see that you're in the green without anything moving. You want me to turn the battery on and... Uh, yeah, sure. Go? Okay. Now what, what you hear there is a low RPM audio, which would come on if your RPM on the rotor got too low. And we have a reset on that. We just turn that off because as we're starting the airplane helicopter, we don't want to hear all that noise. Then after we get it up to operating RPM, we flip the audio on. And then the next time it comes on, it would be truly because you have somewhat of a uh, uh, low rotor. And this is the rotor right here, basically 294 to 3. Uh, 294 to 324 and I think 339 was the max for auto rotation. We would roll this thing up right up to 6600 RPM on the engine and the rotor is turning about 310, 315 right in there. And then we'd back it down because when you go through tra translational lift, we back it down just a little bit, maybe 25 it tends to pick up 25. So you want to operate at 6,600 all the time. This is a torque gauge, it's N1, and this is your uh, EGT. And that's very important for starting. You want to make sure that the uh, helicopter doesn't uh, over temp when you start. So now we're ready. I'll turn the inverters on. <laughs> And we want to check the fuel. This thing is saying that it's got uh, 800 pounds of fuel in it. So we want to run that down. Now we're pushing down through it. It's not indicating anything, but we want to see that once we do that, will it come back to 800 pounds?
and there it is. So that's working. Then we set the throttle, which I'm not going to do now. We just roll it all the way open. Then we bring it back to a detent. And then we're ready to hit the starter and start the aircraft. So you pull the trigger and uh, you're going to hold the trigger until it hits 40%. At 40%, you're going to take your finger off the trigger and it's going to continue to spool up because this throttle is set at idle detent. And generally that's supposed to be 68 to 72 percent. And once we get that, then we hit the inverters again and we would get all of these instruments here like oil pressure, transmission and all that. And one other thing we have here is our segment caution test light. And it's different things that uh, uh, could go wrong and different advisory lights here. And uh, we just check to see if they're all working. And they are. Then we reset. And that would be, I'm going to turn the battery off now. And that would be the start. Then we would just roll it on up to our 6600 RPM and uh, go do a clear left and clear right, making sure that you're, everything's well in the green. And what we used to do in the Army is we would say before takeoff, 6600 RPM, fuel check, fuel pressure, engine instruments, normal. And then we'd be ready to take off. Now, in the, the real scenario in Vietnam, we would be able to get this thing started. We wouldn't go through all these other things. You're flying the same aircraft every day, so you know where the switches are. We just hit that battery, hit that throttle, and you'd have this thing ready to fly in about a minute and a half, two minutes. So uh, <clears throat> that, that's the way we did it there, and uh, that was what we called the scramble. And uh, it just didn't take all that long once you got familiar with the helicopter to get it on off the ground. I can tell you about a mission that I had one time in Vietnam. My platoon leader got me out of bed about 5.30 in the morning. He said that we had a sister unit that was out in the field about to be overrun by uh, the enemy. And they had another uh, squadron trying to get to him. And they were about a click away. And he needed a helicopter to go out and see where he was and give him good vectors to where the other guy would be there's only one very big problem, and that is the fog was all the way down to the ground. It was zero, zero. And uh, as it turned out, this fog deck was about a thousand feet high. And I said to the captain, I, I just don't know how I'm gonna find those guys if I go out to the area of operation. And uh, it's still got this thousand foot between myself and all the way to the ground. And he says, Gary, look, this is what you gotta do. You gotta take off. Go out, talk to him, see if you can do some FM, FM homing for him to get him together because the other guy's going to get overrun. And don't spend a lot of time, leave enough time to go fly down to Saigon, shoot an instrument approach. Because we had an instrument approach of where I flew out of Quan Loi. It wasn't a very low approach. It's called an NDB approach, but that didn't get you but to be within 400, 500 feet of the ground, but our NDB was never working. So there was no way to come back on instruments once you took off from where I flew out of. So that was the plan. Go on out there, and uh, it sounds real simple on paper, and uh, support him as long as I could, leave enough fuel to get down to Saigon to get an instrument approach. So I go out there, and I'm wondering, what am I going to do? How, what, how can I help these guys? And I get this idea. And the idea is, I, I said, you know what? I'll see if these guys got any flares. So the unit that was being attacked, I asked him if he had flares, and the unit that was trying to get to him, I asked him if he had flares. And he said, yeah, we both have flares. I said, send them up. Well, here come two flares. Now it's real simple. I just lined up on those two flares, whatever it was, 095 or whatever, 095 for a click and a half. So waited 15 more minutes, had them launch flares up again. Eh, you know, 100 degrees. Waited 15 more minutes, and they're making progress getting to this guy, and they're going in a straight line to him now, right? Only problem is, we're to the point where we have to go to Saigon because I don't have any more fuel to do anything else. So I said to him, we're going to have to break away. And a guy says, I got to have 30 more minutes, 30 or 40 more minutes. I got to have it. I won't get to him if I don't have these vectors, 30, 40, 30, 40 more minutes. And I'm saying to myself, I don't have enough. So I got on my intercom to the crew. I said, here's a story. Those guys are going to get killed unless we can stay here. We're going to risk our lives and not be able to get back if we do stay here. So we're supposed to break to go down to Saigon right now and get an instrument approach, but I'll, I'll let you guys have a vote. We can stay and get them there and take our chances going back to Quan Loi, maybe FM home over there, make a blind descent, see if we can get in, or we can leave right now. What do you vote? Every, every man to the man said, let's stay. 
So we stayed and we probably stayed another hour and we got that unit to the unit that was going to be overrun and they were able to save all of those guys there. And they took the enemy out that had that unit surrounded. So now they're there and we're going back to Quan Loy and I go back to Quan Loy and we had uh, FM radios on the ground and the FM radio worked a little bit like a, uh, a VOR and that is when you crossed over top of the beacon you'd get a from and go from to to from. So I, I at least knew where our headquarters was because it was their radio. So I flew over that and uh, I had a good idea where the base was and I just did some time turns to come around and do a descent. Hopefully we'd break out. Well, I did a descent and we weren't even close to breaking out because we're, we're in the soup. So I came back around a few more times, made a few more descents and uh, nothing. So now I had to say to the guys, here's the deal. We are, had a 20 minute fuel light come on 15 minutes ago. We got five minutes of fuel. We are going to have to make this descent and it's going to have to go till we see something or hit something. So cinch your belts up. This is where we're at. So I made the time turn and I just came up in a left hand bank and I was aircraft commander. So I sat in your seat in the civilian world the pilot in command sits in this seat. But in the army, your co-pilot sat here and I sat there. So I made a left turn and down through the fog, I saw where we would land for fuel. There were square PSP pads about the size of what we're sitting on right now. And I looked down there and I saw a fuel nozzle and a PSP pad. I just stood this Huey on its tail, lost all the airspeed and came straight down and landed on that pad. <laughs> oh man, we landed with about two minutes of fuel and the tower said, where in the hell did you come from? You know, but it was good. We got the job done. Those guys, uh, you know, got back to our uh, unit commanders and told them that we saved their butt. And it was, uh, it was very fulfilling when you would do something like that. But boy, I tell you, um, that was a real risky scenario. And it, the only thing I can say about it, it really, I was 20 years old. It helps to be 20. It really does, and, that's, and it also helps tremendously not to be married. I was single, I didn't have a wife, I didn't have any kids, so I could really afford to hang it out, you know? And um, that, that was uh, very rewarding.